All right, well, we return this morning to the second book of the Torah. Would you please open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 20? Exodus chapter 20, <clears throat> verse 13. You shall not commit murder. Up to this point, we have been addressing the commandment from the way it was delivered as the voice of God thundered these words from on top of Mount Sinai. Following two commandments that were given in the positive The sixth commandment picks up again the negative prohibition refrain. No, 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 no. You shall not. And so we've been looking at this issue of murder, which is the intentional unjust killing of a human being. We've looked at murder and we've looked at self-murder. We also considered murder of the preborn and the ethical issues surrounding the end of life where decisions are made regarding the withholding or the withdrawing of treatment from a person who is facing terminal situations. Our lives are united with our bodies. We are more than a body, yes, but we are fundamentally persons embodied. How you treat a person's body relates to their whole person as well. And so God's word is abundantly clear that we are made in God's image and to kill a person's body unjustly is strictly prohibited. And we also know that our souls are eternal and we do not go out of existence when our body dies. But we step into eternity where we either are with the Lord in paradise or we are separated from him in torment as we await final judgment and resurrection of the body. For, listen, we will be embodied persons forever. You ever stop to really think about that? That when this body lays down in the grave... It is not the end of a body for you. But today, I want to expand on the commandment to get to the heart of the matter and to consider this commandment from also the positive perspective. Remember that each of these commandments is not meant to be something that is narrow and wooden, but instead, as the psalmist psalmist notes in Psalm 119, verse 96, he says, your commandment is exceedingly broad. Each of these commandments are the expressions of God's principles for love. This is God's law of love. If you love someone, you do not murder them. Well, that sounds obvious. And look at all of us. We're all sitting here not murdering each other. Good for us, right? But you know intuitively that love goes deeper than just not killing someone. There is great care that we need to have for the life of others so that we do not do evil to them, but also do good to them. You know that love is about not doing harm, not doing evil, but it is far more than that. It is also about doing good. Murder is downstream from hatred, and so this commandment, like all the commandments, gets down to the matter of the heart. Because on the surface, it sounds like you got this made. You got this one easy. This might seem like the easiest commandment to not break. Because I can't think of the last time I murdered somebody. Please now turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Verse 
Look at verse 21. You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. These are the words of Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. And these begin a series of six, you have heard that it was said statements. Six times Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, followed by, but I say to you. Jesus is addressing the cultural and religious assumptions about the standard of righteousness that was set not by God, but by the scribes and the Pharisees. Look at verses 19 and 20. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, the verse just preceding what we just read, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The very next verse is what we read in verse 21. You have heard that the ancients were told. And in this passage, Jesus quotes the law of God from Exodus 20 verse 13. Now, that is also the law that the scribes and Pharisees affirmed as true. If you take a life, the court will hold you accountable for your guilt. However, Jesus is about to expand the original intent and meaning of the sixth commandment. This is not a new thing. This is not a novel reinterpretation or a deconstruction. Jesus is affirming that the keeping of this commandment is not merely a matter of avoiding a technicality. The nature of the commandment extends all the way down to the heart of the why. Why would someone murder another human being? It is because they have anger in their heart. It is because they have hatred for and animosity for someone else. All murder is the result of being given over to extreme selfishness. You get angry because you feel wronged. You get angry because your will isn't done. You get angry because you didn't get your way. You get angry because you are envious. You get angry because fill in the blank. You'll be happy to know that the Greek word here actually means angry. It's not a mistranslation. It's not a mischaracterization. Jesus is saying that if you think you can be off the hook with God's judgment because you have never technically murdered anyone, then you don't understand the holiness of God and the depth of his word. If you think that the law is simple and only for those bad guys who are in jail, you are ignorant of the depths of God's law. And notice that Jesus illustrates the heart of the matter in three ways. The first is anger that is in the heart. Anger that is in the heart. It doesn't even come out. It's what you stew on. You're guilty of violating God's law. Second, if your anger comes out of your mouth by saying, you fool, or you empty head, You have broken God's law. Third, if you say, you fool, you have broken God's law. There is, by the way, no meaningful difference between those two sayings. Both are insults from anger and hatred for a brother. But notice that Jesus lists three levels of judgment. The regular court or the lower court, technically they could find you guilty of violating the sixth commandment. The second court, or the Supreme Court, is actually the Sanhedrin. 
And so they could find you guilty of violating the sixth commandment by your, by your words. The last court is the court of divine judgment that here winsome Jesus says, your guilt of angry words against your brother renders you guilty before God's judgment and a worthy sentence would be hellfire. It means that you don't merely break the commandment when you unalive someone. It begins when you are angry with them in your heart. See, some people think <clears throat> that you are guilty of the commandment at the, at the moment you kill someone. No, you were guilty of the commandment long before. And you walked a road of breaking the commandment up until its, its pinnacle, its apex. Now, lest you get the wrong idea of what Jesus is getting at, I want to be clear. Jesus is not flattening out all sin related to the sixth commandment to make anger and insult worthy of the death penalty by human government. He isn't saying that insulting your brother is equal to killing him. If that were the case, who could stand? If that were the case, we should all turn, our, turn ourselves in because we're all murderers. But that's not at all what Jesus is doing. <clears throat> Remember the context. Jesus is talking about the standard of righteousness before God that is to be kept in order to enter the kingdom of God and the standard of righteousness that God has established. He's contrasting it with the standard of righteousness that the scribes and Pharisees have established. And theirs was a pretty low standard by comparison. It was a standard that they believed that they met. Do you remember the rich young ruler? Oh, I've kept all of those from my youth. That was the spirit of Pharisaism. That's the spirit of this religious order. Thinking that the law was simple. That the law could be kept on the surface. And Jesus is identifying, no, this law goes down deep to the core of your heart. That's where the corruption is. That's where murder comes to fruition from. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. You see, even man's anger <clears throat> puts us in an unrighteous standing before God. You break the commandment long before you murder someone, and so at the level of your anger and your insults, you are guilty before God, and as a transgressor of the law, you are judged to be worthy of hell by God's standard. We're talking about divine counsel judgment. And if you go to the level of actually murdering someone, then your life is to be cut short now. You are to receive temporal judgment now so that you enter eternal judgment quicker. That is not the standard for a person who says to his brother or his sister, you fool, expressing hearts of anger. We do not give the death penalty in this life to one who has anger. But we do warn people that anger is at the root of murder. But ultimately, just the anger, not the murder, makes you guilty before God of this, of breaking this commandment. And I hope that's clear. It is not the same, but they are rooted in the same law, the same commandment. And what Jesus is getting at here is that it means that you cannot earn your salvation, purchase a ticket to heaven by means of keeping the law, by means of your own works. Why? Because every one of us is guilty before the age of two. We have no merit before God. We stand condemned for our anger. And you can't undo your sin. 
What happens in life is real. You can't say you aren't responsible for your sin, and you can't say that's not fair. Why? Because it's not your law. It's not your standard. It's God's. Sorry for my voice. It sounds terrible. It's God's law. And the issue, if you kick against this teaching, it's because you don't understand the holiness of God. We don't understand who God is. You don't understand his perfection, his character, his nature, his purity, his otherness. It's because you're not God. God is God, and he determines the standard by which he judges man. He He establishes the standard by his own character, and we are called then to conform to it. And in our falling short of his glory, then we cast ourselves in faith upon his mercy. Because God is not simply a God of judgment. He is a God also of mercy. And so we cast ourselves as sinners upon the mercy of God through Jesus Christ, and we are forgiven then of every sin. Every violation of the sixth commandment, from homicide to a harsh word to anger that never leaves your heart, is forgiven by the grace and mercy of God through Jesus Christ, who died for that sin. All of our sin is forgiven if we trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But we are all fundamentally lawbreakers at the core at the moment We have anger and hatred in our hearts, which begins in each of us very young. So then the applicational point for us as believers is that we want our hearts to be aligned with God's. We want to discipline our hearts to be free from anger, to be free from hatred, to discipline our tongues to not say hateful things. We want to avoid unrighteous anger that does not accomplish righteousness and that leads to even greater sin. Psalm 37, verses 7 and 8 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. What is it saying? Wait patiently for God. Do not worry about yourself and get angry and to take things into your own hands, but rather trust in Him. Trust that He is the perfect judge. Do not give over your heart to anger and wrath. It only leads to you getting in more trouble. So then the sixth commandment is given to prohibit the extreme end, the top end of the sin that is in view. It gives it at the top. Murder is the pinnacle of breaking this commandment. But know that you've broken it a long time on the way up to the top. Murder, of course, is prohibited, but it also covers all of the sin beneath the act of murder. Unjust violence, ill treatment, unkindness, verbal insult, and anger that lives in the heart. And all of you should say, woe is me, I am undone because I am a murderer at heart. And guilty before God. And if you haven't already, then you ought to cry out, What must I do to be saved? Who will deliver me from my wicked heart? The answer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You will be forgiven. You will be given a new heart. You have remaining flesh where we still deal with sin. But you have a promise of eternal life and a new direction, a new heart that loves God's law and hates to break it. 
But when we flip this commandment over to look at the other side of the quilt, we see a positive element to love as well. Love certainly avoids doing harm to others. But love also looks to do positive good. And do you remember what, what patience and grace God showed to Cain? Genesis chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, it says, But for Cain and for his offering, God had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? <laughs> Murder was already in his heart, wasn't it? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain, you're angry. Sin is crouching, ready to pounce. You must master it. Cain didn't do what was right. He was given the opportunity to do what was right. He didn't do what was right. So he became angry when his disobedient sacrifice was not accepted. And the answer for his anger and his depression is to do well. It is to do what is right. Cain needed to love God, to be devoted to doing what pleased God, not what satisfied himself. Cain needed to be kind to his brother. He needed to go congratulate his brother on his well-doing. Cain's anger that was not countered with love led to murder. <clears throat> and so the answer for murder and depression and anger is love. It is loving God by doing what pleases Him, and it is loving others by doing what is good for them. That's the flip side of all the negative commandments, isn't it? It's love. But specifically regarding the sixth commandment, the positive side of the commandment is preserve life, promote life, protect life. In Genesis chapter 45, verse 5, Joseph acknowledges the wisdom of God who allowed him to suffer many things, but he was also able to see that God sent him to Egypt in order to do what? To preserve life. He sent him to Egypt to do good, to love the world. And what did Joseph do? Well, he developed a plan for saving and storing food in order to preserve life through famine. When people are facing hard times and suffering, it is the opposite of murder to care about and work toward the preserving of their life. The preservation of life is working for the sake of keeping people alive. If people are facing suffering... A hateful or murderous heart doesn't care if someone lives or dies. Very often, the murderous heart is only cared about, caring about one life, but is uncaring towards others. A murderous heart won't take action to help a person in need because they don't care about their life. Cain's response to God was what? Do you remember? Am I my brother's keeper? God asked, Cain, where is your brother Abel? And Cain's answer was, what is his life to me? I have no responsibility for his life. Instead, he considered his brother's life lightly, and he believed that he had no responsibility to preserve life, and instead he took life. And Cain was terribly wrong about being his brother's keeper. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are, Cain. Yes, you are. 
Preserving life is to answer, yes, we are our brother's keeper. We do have an obligation to love one another. And when we have the means, when we have the relationship, when we have the opportunity, we are obligated by God's law of love in the sixth commandment to preserve life. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. It says, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's a wonderful test, not the only test, but it's a wonderful test for evaluating genuine faith. Do you have the world's goods and do you see someone in need? Can you close your heart to him and be one of God's children? Of course not. John is saying that the evidence of a genuine faith where God's love has changed our hearts and changed our relationship to God's law results in love that is generous, <clears throat> love that gives, love that meets needs. Would you turn with me now to the book of James? James chapter 2, <clears throat> beginning in verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, <coughs> excuse me, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. Hey, here's someone, they don't have clothes and they don't have food. And you say, I'll pray for a miracle. Godspeed. but you don't give them what they need? That's not saving faith. That's not faith that goes to work. That's a fraud. That's fake faith. Here, the book of James, which is the Proverbs of the New Testament, looks to the issue of saving faith. And what he, does he say? He says that one who claims that they have faith, but who closes his heart to others who have needs for their body, how can that be saving faith? The expected answer is it can't be. Christianity is not simply about a spiritual enterprise, a faith in faith, a message only about afterlife. It includes a message of afterlife, but it is comprehensive for all of life. And James teaches that when we know someone who is in need, represented here by food and clothing as an example, but this is not meant to be exclusive to those things. James is not, is not limiting the needs of others to food and clothing. You get that, right? You know how to read and use your Bible, right? Food and clothing are not the only needs a person has. Rather, this is representative of what a person needs. A person needs also shelter, or they die of exposure. They need a place to live. A person may need medicine or surgery. A person may need water. A person may need glasses to see. A person may need transportation. A person may need a job. A person may need a lot of things. And the issue is that faith in God is not simply, I'll pray for a miracle. Be warmed and be filled. I hope you get that miracle that you need. I'll pray for you. Is insufficient faith. No, faith in God loves others through preserving and promoting life by opening your heart and meeting their needs. 
It is not don't pray, it's as you pray, meet those needs. For in the doing, God is also answering. God works often through his providential means in the lives of his children. If you are suffering, I don't just sit there and watch you suffer. Love that keeps the sixth commandment, that loves life, does what is needed to promote and save life. Let's turn now to our Savior. Would you please go with me to Matthew chapter 4? Matthew chapter 4. Look at verse 23. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When evening came, go ahead and turn there. Matthew eight sixteen. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. Chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now drop down to chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Drop down now to verse 7. And as you go... Preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. From the person of Jesus, we see the message of the gospel of the kingdom. And accompanying this, we have the love and the compassion and the kindness, the favor, the mercy to meet every need. If it was spiritual bondage, he loosed it. If it was hunger, he fed it. If it was a disease, a sickness, a paralysis, every kind of infirmity, Jesus healed it, and he did so with his divine power. But then in chapter 10, Jesus has discipled the disciples, and he now sends them out to do what? To do the same thing to do the very same things that he was doing. He called them to preach the gospel of the kingdom. He told them to have the same disposition toward the sick and the dead and the leper and the demoniac. He sent them to have compassion with action so as to help, to heal, to deliver. And he empowered them to work the works of Jesus and to multiply his ministry. Luke chapter 9 verse 6 says that they began going throughout the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Jesus multiplied his ministry through sending out 12 men. In essence, you had 12 Jesuses ministering now throughout the region. Jesus demonstrated and taught a ministry of love for life. Love for eternal spiritual life and love for the life of the body here and now. Now what we know is that this gifting of power to heal as a sign of the coming of the kingdom in the person of Christ and the establishment of the church did not remain. 
It authenticated the message, the authority given by God, and that power to heal through supernatural means came to an end in the first generation of the apostles with the closing of the canon. But that does not mean the ministry of love for the needy, the poor, and the sick came to an end. God's people continue to have the heart of Jesus to serve the needs of the body, to love the souls of those who are suffering and dying. This has been the ministry of the church from its inception. Truly, it's the ministry of God's people from the beginning of mankind. Turn over now to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, and remember that this is the positive side of loving our neighbor through the sixth commandment, which we're reminded is don't murder, don't hate, don't be angry, don't despise and treat the image of God cheaply. Instead, we are to value life, preserve it, promote it, and protect it. And listen, it doesn't require miracle power or supernatural gifts. It simply requires the loving heart of Jesus to pursue the meeting of needs. Look now, beginning at verse 31. Interesting, by the way, that Kelly referenced it even in his prayer. Matthew 25, verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, so now we're talking about the end of the days, end of time. And all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. And you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, I don't remember that. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and came to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. This passage looks at the whole history of the church, not simply the gifts of the first century. No evidence here of normative miracle working powers. Not, not when I was sick, you healed me by miracle. Not simply the gifts of the first century. It looks to those who, upon looking to Christ, demonstrate Christ's likeness in their compassion and their behavior. They had faith that actually worked. They had faith that showed action, not just waited for the trumpet call. Because Christians love to meet the needs of others. Are you hungry or thirsty or naked? We Christians seek to help. If you are sick, the word here for visit is not a word for sitting there, watching you suffer, or a word for visiting for the sake of fellowship or mutual enjoyment. It is a word, episcopeo, episcopeo, that may have a familiar ring to it, doesn't it? A pastor or an elder is an episcopos, an overseer, one who watches over. Episcopeo is the verbal idea of one who watches over, who visits in order to look after, to care for. James 1.27 speaks of visiting orphans and widows in their distress. The concept here is not to drop by and say hi. Or sit with them and leave them without meeting their needs. No, when you visit an orphan or a widow, you give them what is necessary for their lives. 
When you visit the sick, you seek to meet their needs for life in whatever way you can. You might not have everything that you would like to have, but you do come with everything you have, including yourself. When you visit the sick, you seek to meet their needs for life. You care for them. And listen, it is Christianity. It is Christianity that has brought to the world the ministries, the charities, the industries of hospitals and medicine. Without Christianity, by the way, did you hear Richard Dawkins talk about how he really kind of liked the idea of living in a Christian nation and would rather not live in a different one? Oh, I reject all of Christianity and everything it says, but man, they kind of produce some good stuff. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Thanks be to God, for it is God's work in our hearts. Listen to author John Dickerson, quote, Hospitals began as Christian charities because back in the 1800s, look, they're not that old. Back in the 1800s, there were no hospitals as we know them today. The best and most expensive doctors only made house calls, which meant that only rich people could afford to see a doctor. The poor had to go without doctors. And so Christians, motivated by Christ's teaching to, quote, care for the least of these, looking to Matthew 25, began building hospitals where the poor could receive the medical care they could not afford. This was the birth of today's hospitals, end quote. He continued, quote, Christian pastors cast the vision for these hospitals. This was the brainchild of pastors calling for action from the hearts of those who belong to Christ. Christian donors supported these hospitals providing the bricks and beds, and Christian universities provided the medical faculty and first doctors for these hospitals, end quote. It is a love for the poor and the needy and the sick that brings about study and knowledge and skill and medicine and equipment and surgeries and comforts that lead to preserving and promoting life. And in meeting the needs of others, especially of the saints, we become the ministers of Christ to Christ. When we love our brothers and sisters and all of our neighbors, we demonstrate that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. Now last week, I, <clears throat> I promised the, to address this matter of the sixth commandment relative also to the cult of the followers. A large number of former followers are part of our church, and we all love every one of you, and we hurt for those who are still mired in the muck of false religion and self-righteousness and the culture of death within that community. For those of you that don't know, the glue that holds this community of false religion together is their refusal of medical treatment or the making use of doctors, medicine, or hospitals. And my thoughts went toward their plight in the midst of this study on the Sixth Commandment, as well as our study of biblical stewardship and our discussion of technology on Sunday nights. The followers are happy to use the tools for work and for play. They make, they make use of guns and trucks and mowers and tractors and all kinds of other things. But when it comes to the technology and tools of health and the preserving of life, their reliance, <clears throat> excuse me, their reliance is upon their own faith. Their God is not the God of the Bible. Their hope is not the saving work of Christ. Their God is a false God of their own making, yet they hope for his miracle working power to heal and to save. To be fair, they believe that they love their loved ones. They give of themselves to meet the needs of their family and friends, but they are suspicious of new technology that in God's providence, working through the efforts of God, honoring means of preserving life, they are, they are only dedicated to wooden interpretations of Scripture, which amounts to believing lies. They are excellent caregivers with pillows, Blankets, cleanliness, 
ice, water, and food. They will use tape and popsicle sticks, glue, but God forbid that a woman's internal bleeding be stopped by a skilled doctor. Heaven forbid that an infection be cured with a simple antibiotic. Lord, help them if they give in to the wicked ways of the world, which were the brainchild and invention of Christians, showing love and mercy for all of life, and they be visited by those who are skilled at visiting the sick. The medical field are not miracle workers. They are simply part of God's good purposes in taking dominion over the earth so that they may have skill in work for life. Medicine and medical treatment is about love for life. And all of us are dependent upon God's will and His providential purposes in all of life for medical workers are, can only do so much because God is sovereign. God has His purposes. But we are called to love. We are called to preserve life, to protect life. To promote it. And in this passage, we see the work of God through his people and for the sake of Christ, through the preserving, promoting, and protecting of life. The darkness that covers the cult of the followers is a darkness of death. And one of the ways we identify it as a false religion is by its hatred for life. Now, of course, no false religion cou uh, couches it in those terms. It's in the language of love that they would speak. The religious offerings of children to Molech speak in terms of love of life also, don't they? But the followers are a false religion of evil patriarchy shown primarily by how the men treat the lives of their women and children. Besides not knowing how to love as Christ loves his bride, the church, follower men stand by and watch their women and children die as they flatter themselves with their sorrow and devotion to burial. They protect their high places called deathbeds from those who would actually show love and their women have been deceived by their doctrines of demons. These men of the followers are cowards while they boast in their arms of flesh to work and to serve mammon. If their truck breaks down, they get it fixed. If their plumbing has a leak, they get it fixed. They don't visit their truck on, or their house by sitting and praying for a miracle. They boast in their work their arm of flesh, their knowledge, their wisdom and strength out of love for themselves. For that is what all false religion, that is what all mankind is. It is in love for self. Love for their idol of work and God of money. But if their wife is dying from a treatable issue in their own foolishness and self-deception, under the banner of love, they let her bleed to death. It is devilish because Satan loves death and was a murderer from the beginning. And our concern for this evil is for the lives of those who suffer and for the eternal condemnation that they are under. I preach this way because I long for them to be freed as so many of you have. Thanks be to God. Our desire is for them to lay aside their self-righteousness and the blindness of their idolatry and to trust their Savior. If they come to know Him, then they will truly come to understand the meaning of true love and the impact of the gospel on all of life, including how to love <clears throat> those they care most about. Because when you come to love God, or rather to be loved by God, you love his law, and you want to preserve life. And when you have the means, the relationship and the opportunity, you take it. Listen, our Savior does not delight in the death of anyone. 
His commandments are love and life. Our Savior loves life, and He has sent out His people into the world to preach the gospel of eternal life and to show true love through obedience to the sixth commandment. Because we speak words of life. We start hospitals. We invent tools and medicine. But it is actually a murderous heart to have available to you the opportunity and the means to access these tools of medicine to preserve life and then to refuse it. But a heart of love seeks to do everything we can to preserve life, to visit the sick with the care for whatever they need to live. Whether it is old technology, which, as we've talked about on Sunday nights, old technology doesn't make it bad technology. Whether it's new technology and tools, our heartbeat must to love life and to preserve it. Our prayer for everyone, but in this time and in our context, I've highlighted the followers as a particular example. Our prayer is for the lost to have the scales of blindness their hatred for life, their love for death, to be removed and be broken by the love and light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that they might have new hearts of flesh. Their self-love, their self-righteousness, their hatred for women and children, their despising of God's word needs the life-giving water and food of the person of Jesus Christ. He is the food and the water that they need. They need it to be given to them. The sixth commandment condemns all of us. And it points us to the Savior who died so that we might live. By the way, <clears throat> I received a wonderful question last week from a young man in our church. He asked the question, a thoughtful question. If someone offers himself to be killed for the sake of someone else, for instance, maybe a son stands in front of his assailant to protect his mother, is that the same as suicide? What a great question. That's not suicide. That's love. To lay down your life so that someone else will live, that's not suicide. That's Christ likeness. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, come to Christ by faith and live because he died for you. Lay aside your pride and your dead works. Repent of your self-righteousness and murderous heart and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives out new hearts for free at the cost of the stopping of his beating heart on the cross. And thanks be to God, he rose from the dead, that you might have the assurance that you too will live forever in a body. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you, <clears throat> grateful for your word. Thankful for your law, which is love. But in that law, it reveals in us that we are not love. We are law breakers. We are those who take your law and who smash it to bits. Long before anyone murders anyone, we sin in our hearts before you, demonstrating that we are unrighteous altogether. We are unworthy to be in your presence. 
access to the kingdom of heaven is denied to all unrighteous sinners of which the entire human race is about. But Father, we come before you grateful to do so because of the knowledge of the love of Christ that has been shown to us. You have been kind and gracious to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to beat where once there was dead stone. We are grateful that your law is now food for us, joy to us. It still reminds us of our remaining flesh and our sin that continues in this life in the body. But ultimately we recognize that there is a new man within. A change has been made. We are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. It has not yet appeared what we will be like, but we know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. We look forward to the day of sinlessness when we no longer offend your holiness. So, Father, in the meantime, we pray that you would sanctify us by your word. Give us courage and motivation to obey. Forgive us of our faults and cleanse us and lift us up and renew us once again. Lord, we pray that you would be with all those who are lost in the darkness of self-righteousness, of thinking that we are good and sufficient in and of ourselves or that we are good in the keeping of ordinances of men Father we pray that you would <clears throat> break hard hearts with the jackhammer of your word that you might create soft hearts in its place Lord we pray for salvation to visit us here in this church but Lord we also pray the salvation would visit friends and family and neighbors, <clears throat> especially right now as we consider the cult of the followers. Lord, we thank you for the grace that has shown the light for so many that are even sitting here today. Think of children being raised in Christian homes now. Wives flourishing and alive and cared for. We think of wives and children who wouldn't be here. And Lord, we want more of that grace. We pray for salvation to visit those who are in darkness and to bring them into the light. We pray for life, eternal and physical, to be saved and cared for and loved. We pray for all the world around us. We pray for our family, our loved ones who don't know you. But Lord, we ask that you would be gracious and humble them. And bring them into your family and into the fold of the body of Christ that they might receive and experience love for truly the first time. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We ask that we would be great lovers of men and women and children because we seek to honor and glorify you and to do these things to you in the midst of this world in which we walk. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.